Welcome back to The Big Picture. Uh, we're talking about climate change uh, and the reality of climate change. And I'm, my guest is uh, Mark Morano. We're talking to him via Skype from the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Mark, uh, we had a good discussion earlier about some of the, uh, the, the statistics. Uh, actually, for 30 years, they've been predicting the rise of the oceans and the rise of the temperatures. And to my knowledge, not one prediction that has gone on for the last 30 years, whether it be from Al Gore or the United Nations or anybody, not one prediction has even remotely come true, not even close. Is that, is that, is that a fact? Well, well, yeah, well, here's the thing. No, their actual thrust of their predictions have not come true. However, they have predictions that come true for one simple reason. There's a few they point to. It's because they predicted opposite outcomes. And I have a whole section in the book, the shameless plug, the politically incorrect guide to climate change, where I detail how they predict more snow, less snow, more hurricanes, less hurricanes, more malaria, less malaria, more fog, less fog. And it goes through a whole series of issues, specifically on snow. Here's a prediction that came true, but it makes no sense when I explain it. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, we had UN scientists and we had top climate researchers affiliated with the UN claiming that snow was a thing of the past, children wouldn't know what snow was. One UN scientist said he bought his daughter a sled, he told the New York Times he lived in New Jersey, but that there's no more snow and she wouldn't be able to use it all because of global warming. Well, fast forward a decade, we have blizzard after blizzard, we have the East Coast, the snowiest decade, and we're only half, we have, by the time we were halfway through the decade of the 2010s, uh, the, uh, the, the, the East Coast was the snowiest decade on record. What did they say? They didn't predict this. Al Gore never made this predict, you know, he predicted less snow. He talked about the snows of Kilimanjaro disappearing, which is a whole other fraud. It never happened and, and was not going to happen. So the issue was, they found a bunch of different studies that at one time or another predicted global warming would cause more snow, but no one ever talked about them, no one ever touted them. And then people started looking deeper into this. And it turns out there's a whole cottage industry of climate predictions that literally predict all outcomes. So if you predict both teams to win the Super Bowl, you can go in the office the next day and say, hey, I predicted a winner. And I go through the whole book. It goes through dozens and dozens of major examples. Another major example is hurricanes. Global warming will cause more hurricanes. We go 13 years without a major landfalling hurricane in the US. Suddenly, global warming will cause less hurricanes, but more powerful hurricanes. They just change it on a dime. So no matter what happens, all these different predictions, they're covered no matter what happens. So that's why it's not even fair to evaluate them on whether their predictions come true. The issue is how in the world do we let them get away with predicting all possible outcomes? Therefore, anything that happens, A, is consistent with global warming, they'll claim, and B, we predicted it. It's scientific fraud at its heart. Yeah, it, 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 if you could bet and, and have a no-lose yes. uh, bet. I mean, I, I'd like that bet. I'd, I'd be in on that one in a heartbeat. And I'm, I'm sure right. the odds makers in Las Vegas would love it as well. Yes. Um, it, it just, it, it defies logic, the way they approach things. And yet the message is so prevalent that the people on the street, the people that I talk to every day, they hear nothing else. So they have this acceptance of the fact that we're in trouble. And it's, it's all because of human behavior. Now, I've done stories in the past about, about sunspots and sun activity. Right. And it, in most of the conclusions that, that uh, those stories have led me to is the fact that if there is any, any warming or cooling, it's, it's usually due to activity on the sun that translates to our environment. Uh, that's, yes. that's, you know, that's really the only way. And we're such small, a small piece of the puzzle mankind on earth you know a, a hurricane a, a volcano can put in one afternoon more pollutants into the atmosphere than the entire human civilization in the course of years 10 years in in this in one afternoon and then it basically nature takes care of it and cleans it up i mean it's a very resilient planet uh, it is. And in, in the book, I point out, first of all, if your concern is carbon dioxide, we are geologically one of the lowest periods of CO2 in the Earth's geologic history. And this is this is a fact. Uh, one scientist says we're in a CO2 
famine. We are talking about trace amounts of CO2. We've had ice ages with higher CO2. We have warmer temperatures with much higher. The correlation is not there in the ice core records. One scientist says CO2 is not the villain as it's been portrayed. And when you mentioned the sun, in the, during the climate gate scandal, all these emails came out from top UN officials basically colluding to create a political narrative on climate and suppress dissent. One of the key things of the climate gate scandal was UN scientists lamenting the fact that solar scientists, scientists who study the sun, were completely not on board. They weren't buying that carbon dioxide was the great influencer or control knob of the climate. And they're actually talking about how they're gonna keep these scientists out of the UN process so they don't create any messiness for the messaging of the United Nations and the idea that we face a catastrophe and the UN will fix it. We just need to transfer all your wealth and have UN treaties and we're gonna be in charge of everything and we need to gut capitalism. So this is where it all becomes. In the book I detail, that other scientists who study the oceans, everyone has their pet, uh, different theories, but no one really knows. But the simplest way, and even the climate activists will admit this, the scientists, there are hundreds of factors, possibly thousands that influence the climate. The idea that carbon dioxide is the control knob among these hundreds of factors led by solar activity, ocean cycles, the solar system, volcanoes, tilt of the Earth's axis, clouds, water vapor, methane, all these other, all these other factors and feedbacks that come from that, is this no way carbon dioxide can overwhelm and become that control knob? And that's the problem here. I go back in the book to the 19th century, everyone, John Kerry, our former Secretary of State, this is as simple as high school physics. We knew this in the 19th century. We knew that carbon dioxide could be a warming influence on the climate. That does not make it A, a problem, and B, the control knob. And I go through the whole book and talk about some of the wacky things that the original theories predicted in, in the 19th century and how, how untrue they've become as well. So this is just a simple theory of they're using this scare. And keep in mind too, you, uh, the 1970s were the, cl the global cooling scare. So everything we're hearing today, floods, droughts, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, this is all due to global warming. Back in the 1970s, they were all due to man-made global cooling. I document that in the book. You can find out not only that, but they blamed wars and more conflict on the man-made global cooling of the time and or natural cooling. So we had CIA reports on this. We had National Academy of Science. And now, what do you think their response has been to the 1970s global cooling scare? It never happened. That was a couple media outlets. They've completely go back just the way they've gone back and revised past temperatures. They're revising the history of the 1970s to say there was no global cooling scare. And, and something that you referred to earlier, and, and this is really kind of a, a key if you're going to understand this, most of the, the uh, theories, as you mentioned, uh, spring from models, computer models of, yes. of what they predict. Now, when you have a computer model, it's only as good as the information that you program into that model. Yeah. And so you can really get an outcome that's, that's d predetermined if you give it the proper input. And so when they have computer models suggesting that the the temperature is going to rise by X number of degrees in the next hundred years, and the the uh, the ocean levels are going to increase and flood out all these you know territories, you know Florida and New York City and so on. That's based on a model that they've created. Yes. It's not based yes. on any fact or anything that that really has any uh, objective. Uh, data. It's just some, as a matter of fact, years ago, uh, and not a lot of people have heard about this because at the time they didn't make a big deal of it, but that hockey stick, uh, yes. you know, uh, scandal, if you will, it, it was, it was uh, emails that were, uh, were discovered by some of the, the scientists who are behind the main theories, and they actually explained in their communications to each other that it was very inconvenient, my apologies to Al Gore, inconvenient to tell the truth about certain statistics that they were working on, so they had to kind of wipe that part of the message yes. out. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that, that scandal? Yes, I have a whole chapter in my book. It's called the Climate Gate Scandal. November 2009, it broke. It was thousands of emails of the top United Nations climate scientists basically revealing that them colluding with each other to craft a narrative 
threatened journal editors and scientists who didn't toe the line. They talked openly about how, how uncertain the science was behind the scenes and how publicly they boasted that there was no debate. And I have, I have chapter, verse, you can go through it. I have one scientist uh, who was part of the climate debate said this was fraud, pure and simple, a Princeton scientist. And now you mentioned models, real quick, models. In the book, I detail how UN scientists admit that models don't account for half the variability in nature. Therefore, they don't expect to do a good job predicting them. Two thirds of all climate studies that's been estimated are modeling studies. And what's interesting is when current reality fails to alarm, make up more modeling studies. So you just, you just scare people by making scarier and scarier predictions of the future. In other words, if nothing's scary going on now with polar bears, sea level, temperature, floods, hurricanes, droughts, tornadoes, what can you do? You can come up with a scarier prediction of 50 years ago than you made and say, oh, it's worse than we thought. You say, how is it worse? Nothing's worse. They go, well, our predictions now of 50 years are much worse than they were just five years ago. So it's worse than we thought. And believe me, the media runs with that. So all they have to do is use these models, make scarier predictions, and they can claim, oh, it's much more dire than we thought. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the bottom line to the people who are listening now who may think that you yes. are, you're a nut and I'm a nut just because we're denying what's obviously the truth, if, if you're out there and, and you're a little confused now by what we're saying, my advice, and maybe Mark, you, you'll weigh in on this, but my advice is go, first of all, and buy this book, <laughs> Politically <laughs> Incorrect go, Guide to Climate Change, okay? This will give you a lot of information that you don't normally get, okay? And it will give, it will make a very strong case for what we've been talking about. And visit the climatedepot.com uh, website. Uh, that will also keep you informed. Don't believe the scam that you're being fed. That's, that's the, you know, have an open mind, but do the research. Uh, Mark, we're out of time. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, it's, it's an important subject. It's something we get bombarded with every day. I just uh, urge the people who are listening now, not just for yourselves, but for your friends and for your relatives, do the research, have the conversation, and understand what's politically motivated and what's truth. And Mark, I'll give you the last word. Well, thank you. I, I'd say no, no parent of kids kindergarten through college should be without this book. It's endorsed by Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist. This book will give you all the names of the top scientists around the world. And you will not think of even if you're a committed believer, there's no way you can read this and come away thinking uh, the same way about the issue. And it also debunks the idea that climate deniers are funded by ExxonMobil. I point out that ExxonMobil is funding the environmentalists so that they can appear green. It has nothing to do. This, this whole argument has been turned on its head scientifically, politically, culturally. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, being thank with you. us. Um, thank you for watching, uh, for the people out there watching uh, the big picture. Thanks so much for watching WBBZ uh, WBBZ TV. It's an important discussion. Think about it, talk about it, understand what's going on. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Bill.